written as far as uh, in your little small town communities where people you're hearing more and more death pertaining to suicides and stuff like that. And see, that's that's the turnover point. That that's going to be the uh, the suppressus that I think if we don't watch towards bringing in the wrath of God, because uh, once will. because yeah. once society gets so contaminated. And I'm going to use Sodom and Gomorrah or during the era of Noah. Once God says, okay, they have reached a point of no return. There's yeah. not going to be no way of helping them. Uh, they're, they're, they're all contaminated. Because if you look at the Bible, God said that he regretted that he had even made man. But he found one righteous person, which was Noah. Yeah. I know his family. Mm -hmm. Well, whenever it reaches the point that God cannot find a decent human being upon to the planet, don't you think he's going to do the exact same thing of what he done before towards yeah. bringing destruction to humanity? He, the destruction is going to be brought on by Satan, but God is going to give allow him more power. He's Like, right now we're still in a phase where God doesn't allow Satan to get any further but once, and it's going to be part of the punishment, you know, the tribulation and all that. So the end of the times, it's he's going to allow Satan to go ahead and take over with more power. The way know? that I understand, because he's going to be coming, reaching into a final. The way that I've interpreted bell. it, it says in the Bible that God Himself will be the one that will throw us off into a sick bed. Mm -hmm. And it will be God himself that will throw us off into great tribulation uh, if we do not repent. Yeah, yeah. The way I understand the Bible, in interpreting it correctly, it says that God himself will come back and will destroy those who are destroying the earth. Yeah. The, the, so, those... so all these storms, all these catastrophes, all these fires, like out in Australia right now, mm -hmm. that's literally God breathing through his nostrils, as it talks about in the Bible, that that these will be all the beginnings of God's sorrows because of the sin of mankind. Yep. Now, yep. if mankind don't have enough sense to wake up, to realize what they're doing to one another as a unit, as a group, as a majority, it's only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. And eventually, God will say enough is enough. Yeah. And it says in the Bible that he will come back in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon them who know not God and upon them who obey not the gospel. And he will come back and gather together his elect from the four corners of the earth that the angels will gather together his elect, mm -hmm. and that's whenever he'll literally burn in fire and brimstone, starting at one side of the planet and going all the way around to the other side of the planet, and everything that humanity has ever built or lived in, regardless whether it's residential or commercial, he'll burn it down to the ground. If you think that you're seeing horror right now on TV oh, pertaining man. to all these shootings and killings and the drugs and all the homosexuals and all the chaos that's going on right now, Joanne, can you only imagine what it's going to be like if God sets this thing on fire, starting yeah. on one end of the planet and going to the other? Yeah. And where all the smoke is going to go up into the atmosphere? And then, you know, it says that the, the sun will be as darkened as sackcloth. Well, guess what happens if the sun is darkened as sackcloth? That means your vegetation ain't going to grow right. Well, if your vegetation don't grow right, that means your crops ain't going to produce like they ought to. Mm -hmm. That means the food chain, the food supply down here on the planet during that time is going to dwindle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dwindle. Yeah. yeah. To the point that the agriculture farming community will basically almost cease to exist. Mm -hmm. So if you yeah, think you're going bad. through hard times now, could you only imagine... Yeah. Because there's no way that the fire, the firemen are going to be able to put out all those fires with them igniting like that all at once. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now, there's no doubt there's certain structures that ain't going to burn pertaining to structures that's made out of brick and mortar, mortar yeah. and, and, and uh, stone and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But by and large, most people live in wood structure, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. By and large. Yeah. 99%. Yeah. Yep. So that is the great tribulation. I do believe that we're in a form of tribulation right now. But we're not in the great tribulation. Yeah. Um, the great tribulation is whenever God shall come back and gather up his elect and he'll basically set this thing ablaze. We're in the, the time of trouble right now. We're in the yeah. time of trouble. We're in time of trouble. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's going to be the um, um, time of sorrow, which I think we're close between the time of trouble and the time of sorrow is when people see this coming on the world and they're fearful. And you look at all these shootings and stuff going on. You know, it's a time of trouble and a time of and a time of sorrow because people they don't understand it. You know why? You know why is all this going on? You know, it's you know, it's sad watching that on TV. It's you know. uh, it's it's come down to the survival to the fittest. Mm -hmm. And regardless yeah. whether you like it or not, it, it almost goes back to the theory of the Wild Wild West show to the point that the man with the with the fastest gun or the biggest gun, mm -hmm. the man left standing, is going to be the survivor. Yeah. It's almost come it's, down to that. It's almost down to the point that you've got to... Like have, a Wild Wild West show. You've got to bear arms. You know, you've got to have guns in your home or carry guns with you. Um, you got to take guns into churches. Missouri. Have you ever heard of that? Oh, my God. Missouri has a... Um, um, conceal and carry um, is open in Missouri. You can have a loaded gun in your car. What? Yep, sure can. It's open. I was talking to a guy at the pawn shop. He sells guns and stuff. I'm like, um, I don't know. I was talking to him about. It. He's like, yeah, in the state of Missouri, you can, you can have it loaded and ready in your car. If a cop pulls you over and you have a loaded gun, you're not gonna go to jail. You know. Yeah, they have an open. But don't you have to? Don't guns. you have a? Ha don't you have to have it registered in your name? Yeah, it doesn't. In other words, registered. you can't be a, a felon no, and have no. a gun, yeah. or you can't uh, be an outlaw and legally have a gun. No, uh -uh. there was a guy in the pawn shop one time. One of the pawn shops in Jeff City that um, he went to pawn a gun, and um, a cop showed up. Because I guess the serial number, they run the serial numbers on them. Right. So the cops You, you told me that you was living in Kenton uh, before you moved to Lynn back up here, which would have been in what year? Um. 97? What? Yeah, 96, 97. 96, 97. Yeah. Do you remember, you probably wasn't around at the time down there in Kenton, a uh, uh, Don Curry, mm -mm. a deputy by the name of Don Curry. No, I don't remember. In 1983, whenever that car rolled over on top of me, and I should have died because two hands miraculously come out of heaven and grab both of my wrists, and I felt the spirit of God enter into my body as this two as this two-ton automobile come crashing down on top of my torso that should have cut me completely in half. They got me to the hospital after me being pinned underneath that car there on Highway 89. They got me to the hospital and my blood pressure was zero, zero. Wow. They couldn't find none of my veins because my veins had shrunk up just like a dilapidated air hose or water hose. And they had to cut down by my ankle to find that main vein going up into your leg to start pumping blood back up into me. Theoretically, scientifically, medically, I was dead. Wow. Barely hanging on. Mm-hmm. I remember waking up in the Martin Hospital 
staring at a doctor from India, looking at me, feeling in my stomach, and telling me, you have got a problem somewhere inside your, inside your intestine. We're going to have to operate on you. Do you have anything you want to say, Mr. Jackson, before we put you under? And I kind of looked at the doctor like in amazement because, you know, whenever you wake up after being unconscious, it's like, is this really real or is this a dream? Well, it was real. You know, I'm laying yeah. on a gurney and this doctor's telling me that I got a problem and I may not make it. Do I have any last words that I want to say before getting put under? And the only thing that I know to say to the doctor was good luck. Because mm -hmm. I didn't know what to say to the guy. I ain't never met him before in my entire life. It just so happens, a miracle happened that day because ordinarily in these little small town hospitals, you don't have a full staff that's on duty all the time. Yeah. They're on call. Yeah. And because they're on call, usually they can be in the operating room within four to five, seven minutes. But still, that's four or five, seven minutes. That's wasted time. Mm -hmm. Just so happens they was already there in the hospital. They was fixing to do a cesarean on a lady towards a birth. And whenever I come into the front door, they realize the uh, the uh, crucialness pertaining to how crucial it was towards them attending to me. And they asked the husband to the wife if it would be all right to keep her. <coughs> oxidated long enough to try to save my life and he said sure go ahead so that was another miracle because mm -hmm. he didn't have to do that he could have said no you're my doctor you're going to work on my wife that's the reason why we're paying you uh get another doctor in here mm -hmm. which would have taken another three five maybe ten minutes mm -hmm. you follow what i'm saying mm -hmm. so this doctor operates on me he cuts me open from stem to stern, physically goes in and removes my intestines good enough that he could go in and, re and repair and remove my spleen that goes basically parallel up and down your, your backbone. Mm -hmm. Because all the pressure had hit so hard that it busted my spleen and that's where I was bleeding out and nobody could see it. Mm -hmm. There was no way of detecting that I was bleeding out like that. Because wow. like I said, whenever I got to the hospital there in Martin, my blood pressure was zero, zero. Oh, wow. Technically wow. and medically, scientifically, I was dead. Wow. Dead. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I wake up about four and a half, five hours later <clears throat> after this doctor performed a surgery, stuck my guts back in my belly the best that he could and took a staple gun and stapled me up with 64 staples that was connected oh both pieces of skin together, just like a woman in a cesarean birth mm -hmm. towards taking a child. Yeah. These big staples was like two inches wide. Man. Metal staples. Oh my that God. That was holding both pieces of skin together. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I stay in the hospital for about six days before they finally decided that I was good enough to release. And I didn't have nowhere to go other than to go back to Miss Aldale's house where Dad's mother was there at the old home place. Because the original home place where we was raised up at uh, was already being preoccupied by another family because Dad had to declare bankruptcy uh, that same year. Mm -hmm. So he was actually living over there where his mother's place was, of course, Miss Aldell at that time, his mother had been transferred up to Weekly County Nursing Home, Miss mm -hmm. Aldell. During the time that I'm in this house, Joanne, Dad goes to ratting and raving about this, and ratting and raving about that, and bringing up this and why didn't you do that and how come you done this and it and it first started out kind of like a, a debate or a hollering match 
But then it even got worse. It intensified and got worse. Well, in the meantime, the doctor that saved my life took his own life up at Martin. Mm -hmm. Committed suicide. Oh, my God. Yeah. Took a handful of pills and ended his life. And, and according to, to my understanding, um, his people from India had done already uh, emerged or advanced over a million dollars in his education for him to be that good. Mm -hmm. He was just up there as an intern getting the rest of his training in. And then from there, he was going to be distributed wherever a nice hospital was. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky that that doctor was at that particular small town hospital that day. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyways, the arguing and the fight got so intense that uh, my mother almost had a nervous breakdown. Oh, wow. Because at the time, she had moved back in there with him. And the first, the first supernatural occurrence that happened because I knew in the back of my mind that God had saved my life. I, I remember distinctively these two hands that come out of nowhere that grabbed both of my wrists and the Spirit of God that went into my body. So I knew that my life had been spared from a supernatural form, spiritually mm -hmm. form. Yeah. And the only thing that I could reflect back to, the reason why that God had saved my life, that it had to have something to do with the end time events pertaining to the book of revelations which was falling into the realm of the antichrist was <coughs> falling into the realm of the false prophet was falling into the realm of other things that i had been taught as a child growing up mm. it led into i was laying in the bed praying, reading scriptures, trying to figure all this out. In the meantime, I had all this other stuff going on with dad and my doctor that died that was chaotic. And it was so overwhelming that I had almost become delusional. Mm -hmm. You keep in mind, I just pres uh, recently had a complete total blood transfusion. I had lost over nine units of blood. Wow. And every ounce of blood that was in me at that point in time was somebody else's blood. Oh my God, yeah. So I'm laying in the bed and I go to sleep and all of a sudden I have a vision. And this vision is this beautiful, most beautiful human being that I'd ever laid my eyes on pertaining to this woman that was coming at me wanting to give me a kiss. Could have been an angel. Well, it looked like a woman. I thought it was an angel. <laughs> oh, okay. But it was a demon. Oh, and okay. And just about the time that the, that the woman got close enough to me that her lips was fixing to touch my lips, it was as if a camera went off in the room and it flashed. And all of a sudden, instead of me seeing a good-looking woman, I seen one of the most horrible creatures that I think that I had ever laid my eyes on to the point that I'm laying in the bed almost having a coronary arrest of looking at this, this being that now I have identified as being my adversary, my enemy. And, Joanne, I couldn't breathe. Wow. I yeah. couldn't move. I couldn't move, not even, I couldn't even move a, a, a twi my twinkle little finger. And the only thing that I know to do at that point in time was to start crying out, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. Satan, get this behind me. Satan, get this behind me. And I was doing this subconsciously in my mind because I couldn't speak it. My tongue was tied. Yeah. My fingers was, 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 was frozen. My arms was frozen. My chest was frozen. I couldn't breathe. But the only thing that I could do was subconsciously, God help me. 
Jesus, help me. Satan, get this behind me. That not only happened one night, but the following next night, it happened again. Mm -hmm. The second night. Yeah. Well, whenever it happened the second night of seeing the same vision, the same way, you keep in mind, I'd already explained to Mom what was going on. And she was trying to she was trying to interpret all this stuff, too. Plus, arguing with Dad, almost having a nervous breakdown. He was he was crazy. He was mad in the head. Um, I get up, get on the telephone. I call Almas across the street, Almas and Oler. And I tell Almas, Almas, I need some help. I need prayer, and I need prayer now. Please come over here at the house. I call up J.M. Willis. J.M. and Lenore Baker, I mean uh, Willis, up the road. J.M., I need your help and I need it now. Please come down here and pray for me. And believe it or not, both of those men, at 2 o'clock in the morning, come down to Miss Aldell's and woke Dad and Mom up because they had no idea what was going on and come in there and prayed for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, that just upset Bobby Jackson to no end. Wow. He thought that that was the most embarrassing thing that anybody could have ever done was to call up the neighbors at 2 o'clock at night and ask them to come down there and pray for somebody. Wow, yeah. It just totally, just totally freaked him out that I would even have imagined towards doing this, much less actually doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From then on, he become a wild man. Yeah. A literal madman. At the time, his brother, J.W., the one that drank all the time, you probably remember him, mm -hmm. um, was in Grandma's house, and I had made a telephone call. This was within about the third week after the accident actually occurred. The doctor was dead. All this excitement was going on. I made a telephone call to a place out in California called Ripley's Believe It or Not. They had a show going on on TV, and they would advertise on the end of the show that if anybody had any type of story that sounded unusual or sounded like it was a supernatural story, to contact this number, and they would get back with the, with the person, and maybe you'd wind up on TV towards being able to share your testimony in the glory of God, towards giving God our Heavenly Father, mm -hmm. the praise for you being able to go through such of a dilemma like that. Yeah. So I made the telephone call. Well, whenever you make a telephone call like that, it's a hit and miss thing. And you, you kind of hope in one hand, but at the same time, you kind of expect, yeah, this is probably just going to be another dud. Believe it or not, the people that I contacted called back. And Dad was the one that was closest to the phone. And he picked up the phone. The story that I'm telling you is accurate. The story that I'm telling you is true. Mm -hmm. He picks up that little green phone that Grandma had that had that long cord on it. That, I don't know, teal green, pea green phone. And once he identified who it was on the other end of the line towards Ripley's Believe It or Not, that it was a show out of California... He freaking went off and jerked the phone off of the wall yeah. and, oh, and then looked at me and asked me, how in the hell did they find out about this? Because he didn't want nobody to know that a miracle had happened in my life. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, Joanne, I had been fed up with all the bickering, all the arguing, all the all the uh, spiritual warfare that was going on in our lives, and I stood to my feet while I was sitting at the end of the table, and I looked at him and I said, let me tell you something. If this does not end, I'm either going to take a gun and blow my own brains out, or I'm going to take one and blow yours out. This disturbances and, and warfare that we're in is going to end. I literally seen him Joanne, and you may think that I'm lying. I literally seen him jump as an athlete and went into the air and floated for like 30 feet. He was at the, over by the sink where the telephone was, 
and the position that I was at on, on the other end of the kitchen was next to the living room in a bedroom. He literally leaped in the air and was coming at me. And of course, the only thing that I could think of, oh my God, I've got an open womb here with 64 staples up and down. And he's fixing to finish me off and kill me. Oh my God, yeah. So I immediately fell to my knees and I fell to my face and I took my, my arms and I put it over my both of my ears. And sure enough, as soon as he hit the ground, he hit the ground with both fists beating as hard as he could on the back of my head and on the back of my back trying to kill me. Oh my God, yeah. And if it wasn't for his brother J.W. that was sitting in the living room at the time watching TV that got up, Bobby, 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 you're going to kill him, you're going to kill him, <clears throat> like that. And finally J.W. gets out and grabs him and jerks him off of me. Yeah. Realizing... Uh that Bobby Jackson had done already come totally unhinged to the point that now he's attacking, he's attacking somebody in the condition that I'm in. Yeah, wow, ouch. Man, yeah, he didn't think, you know, wow. Yeah, it sounds like Uncle Bob would be, yeah. He had his spells, that's for sure. Man, that was... You're lucky you're alive. You've lived through, you've been through a lot. That's for sure. Yeah. Wow. What time is it? Oh. We gotta leave at what time? 8.30? No, I don't know. I'm gonna have to brush my teeth, brush my hair. Maybe well, let me finish my story. Let me finish my story real quick. Okay. The next morning, I got to thinking that night, my God, he tried to take my life, didn't he? Because like here I yeah. am with 64 staples. He, was mad, real, I, he always had anger issues anyway. So, oh, yeah. Here I know. am with 64 staples up and down my belly. And and I'm thinking to myself, he could have killed me. He's wanting to kill me. That's uh, what he's wanting to do. He's not just wanting to rough me up a little bit towards arguing and getting into a, uh, some sort of a spiritual battle here. He's actually wanting to kill me. So at that point in time, I literally felt like that my life yeah, I've, was I've been through that with uh, Buddy King because when we would get into it, really, you know, and you would really think that, you know, that he was going to kill me, you know, I would think that. Well, so, guess but, what? I, you know, and I, they're capable of it though when they get that man. Yeah, guess they what? They are capable of it, and guess what? Like, I done the fall next morning. I start walking because my car was totaled. You know where the car rolled over on top of me. I didn't have an automobile. And I wasn't going to ask him. I wasn't going to ask the old man for an automobile. Uh, so I started walking. I walked all the way through the bottoms, down about hop in. I walked all the way to Kenton. Once I get to Kenton, turn right and walk up all the way up the road till I got to Miss Lucille, Lucille, our grandmother yeah. house. Uh -huh. And I went into that big old two-story house that Aunt Lily used to live in. Mm -hmm. That grandma eventually took over for Didn't a while. Didn't the Rings own that house? That they own that big house and they own the house Mom Lucy lived in. Too. Well, both those houses now tore down. Yeah, but they own those one of for. I don't they own both of them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, her sister owned both of those houses. Yeah. And Lily did. And, uh, and actually, big Jim. um, um, let's see, um, Mom Lucy's uh, husband, our grandfather, um, helped build those houses. Yeah, Jesse. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. First thing I do whenever I go into her house, I pick up the phone. I ask a uh, directory what the White House's telephone number is. She gives it to me, and I dial the White House, and I tell a receptionist that I'm going to be the one to meet the Antichrist, and before the poison arrow strikes the flesh of my skin, I'm going to disappear, and that's whenever the rapture or the taking away of the saints is going to occur. I slammed the phone down. I turned around. I looked at Grandma. I looked at Mom. I said, I'm going to the police. I feel like my life is in danger. And I proceeded to walk in again, walked out of the house, started walking back towards Kenton, and walked directly into the city hall. And there sat, at the time, a deputy, by the name of uh, Don Curry. 
I told Don Curry the incident that had occurred the night before. I told Don Curry that I'd made a telephone call to the White House. And I told Don Curry that I felt like that my life was in jeopardy, in danger. You know what Don Curry done? Juby, have you been drinking? I go, no, I ain't drank the drop. He goes, Are, would you be willing to blow into this inner tube, this this device, to prove to me that you ain't been drinking? Because I guess he was thinking that he was going to get me for public PD or something. Mm. Public drunk. I blowed into the inner tube. Zero, zero. No alcohol at all. None. Zero. So you know what this idiot does? He locks me up in the jail. Because in the back of the city hall, most of these city halls has a temporary holding cell in case they have a problem in the city and then, that, and then they can divert it over to the county because the county's got the bigger jail cells. So I'm locked up for a couple hours not realizing what's going on. What he was doing was calling up Dad oh, and wow. calling up different people to bring them to the city hall that night to have a powwow. Oh, wow. To have a set down. Thing about it is, Don Curry knew exactly how my father was as far as his outlandish behavior and as far as him being brutal to the family. He mm -hmm. knew exactly because Don Curry wound up marrying uh, one of the Robinson girls that was associated with, with uh, J.M. Willis that lived just within rocks throwing distance of our house. Oh. So it wasn't nothing for Don Curry to be driving up and down our our uh, road and know just exactly what type of temperament that my father had. Mm -hmm. That night, Damien Cross, the mayor, mm -hmm. Don Curry, two or three other cops, two or three other people, and mom and dad sat in this big table where you could probably put 10, 12 people in this big round table. And of course, I'm sitting at one end of it. And before it's all said and done with Joanne, I'm the bad guy, according to them. I'm the guy that's a delusional pertaining to the Antichrist. And I'm the guy that needs help. Mm -hmm. And the way that they approached me was like this. Juby, we think you need to be institutionalized. Juby, if you don't do this voluntarily, we will force you to do this involuntarily. Mm -hmm. You're going to go to Bolivar. And know. you're going to be psychoanalyzed. And the person that should have went to Bolivar that night, or went to jail for attempted murder,